Hello, this is BBC World News Today with me, Karen Giannone. President Putin orders the withdrawal of many of Russia's forces from Syria. He said Russia's military intervention there had largely achieved its objectives. Undeterred by closed border, the refugees seeking another way out of Greece on their journey north. Turkey's government blames the Kurds for Sunday's deadly bomb attack in Ankara and launches airstrikes against them in northern Iraq. And why this stunt by Top Gear's new presenters has got viewers hot under the bonnet even before the relaunch of the BBC programme. Well, Russia's president seized the military momentum in Syria by deploying Russian warplanes there last September. Now he sees the diplomatic momentum by saying he's going to start to pull out the main part of his military forces within 24 hours. Mr Putin made the announcement a short time ago at a meeting with his foreign and defence ministers at the Kremlin. I consider the mission set for the defence ministry and the armed forces on the whole has been accomplished. I am therefore ordering the Defence Ministry to begin the withdrawal of the main part of our military force from the Syrian Arab Republic from tomorrow. Watching events from Moscow, our correspondent there, Steve Rosenberg. And Steve, what is this likely to mean in practice for Russia's military? Well, it's a surprise, uh, first of all. When Vladimir Putin uh, asked his parliament last September to sanction a military operation in Syria, that surprised the world. And he's done it again today, announcing that the main part of um, the Russian forces there will be withdrawn. Uh, it means that I think a lot of the, the, the pilots uh, who have been flying sorties over the last few months will be brought home. It doesn't mean that there won't be any Russian troops left in Syria. That's not the case. The Russian air base, Khmeimim, near Latakia, that will remain. And so will Russia's naval facility in Tartus. And President Putin made it quite clear that those two key facilities for Russia will be defended uh, from land, from sea and from the air. So there will be a number of troops there. But it is clear from what the Russian president said today, that the main part, the majority of Russian troops uh, currently in Syria will uh, begin a withdrawal. How key a role has Russia played in what we've seen happening over the recent months in Syria? You yourself have spent time with Russian forces inside Syria. Yes, the Russian military operation really has changed the whole situation um, in Syria. Uh, if you go back half a year, President Assad was under huge pressure. Uh, the Russian military operation has bolstered uh, the Syrian president. And uh, President Putin said that the task that he gave to the defense ministry and to the Russian military five and a half months ago has in the main been fulfilled. Uh, the Russians admit that terrorism has not been destroyed, has not been beaten fully uh, in Syria. And I asked that question of uh, President Putin's press secretary uh, a few minutes ago over the phone. He admitted that uh, uh, it would be a mistake to make a statement about a victory over terrorism. He said that no country has scored a victory over terrorism. But if you go back to the, the task that President Putin set his military five and a half months ago, he said he didn't want Russia to go into this conflict um, head first. He said that Russia's uh, air operation uh, would continue as long as the Syrian army was going on the offensive. And now the Kremlin has obviously, uh, obviously believes that this is the moment to pull out it doesn't want to get bogged down into a, a long, protracted war in Syria. And the Kremlin is using this cessation of hostilities, a quietening down of the conflict that, we, that we've seen over the last few days in Syria, uh, to, to announce a withdrawal. So you could say it's a great tactical move uh, by, by Vladimir Putin, but only time will tell whether that is the case. Steve, thanks very much. Steve Rosenberg in Moscow. And uh, we'll be speaking to our Middle East editor, Jeremy Bowen, uh, in a few minutes' time.
Now, just days before European Union leaders are due to finalise plans to send refugees and migrants in Greece back to Turkey, desperate measures are being taken to try to find a route north. Around 14,000 people have been stranded at the Idomeni refugee camp in Greece. Earlier, around 1,000 of them left the camp, then started wading across a fast-flowing river to try to reach the next country up, Macedonia. Danny Savage sends this report. On the march with nothing to lose, thousands of migrants walking towards a border they're not allowed to cross. They've had enough of waiting. For weeks they've been stuck in Greece. They're aiming to get to Germany, but all the Balkan border gates between here and there have slammed shut. But they've got this far and they're not giving up. Good morning. Police Macedonia are not open the borders. Uh, very problem, problem, problem. Uh, and the people, everybody going to Macedonia and Germany. The march sparks alarm among the Macedonian authorities who monitor them. But on the Greek side, they are not stopped. The migrants are undeterred by the obstacles in their path. At least three people drowned near here last night, but they're prepared to take the risk. Desperate people will do desperate things. They've become disillusioned with the conditions in this border camp. It turned into a swamp after days of rain. Unbearable. Anywhere is better than this, they thought. Which is why they set off en masse from here this morning when many hundreds did eventually cross the frontier. They were rounded up and detained. Their ambitions on hold once again. The path ahead is not easy and full of risks, but it's not putting them off trying. Danny Savage, BBC News, Northern Greece. Well, the handling of the migrant crisis has been a key issue for German voters with Angela Merkel's party suffering losses during this weekend's regional elections. The German Chancellor, though, has insisted she won't change her immigration policies. The anti-immigration party, Alternative for Deutschland, which won its first seats in the weekend poll, had campaigned against what it called Chancellor Merkel's catastrophic decision to welcome a million migrants and refugees last year. Jenny Hill has more. Germany's political landscape is changing. But don't expect Angela Merkel to alter her course. This is the eastern state of Saxony-Anhalt, where one in four voters backed the anti-Merkel, anti-migrant party, Alternative for Deutschland. I voted for AFD, Laura tells us, because I don't like the refugee policy. I don't particularly like the AFD people, but they're the only party that wants to restore order. <laughs> Germany's political right have found a public voice. AFD is controversial. Its leader recently suggested border guards shoot at illegal immigrants. Angela Merkel had dismissed them as a small fringe party. This afternoon, she admitted, it's been a tough day at the office. Our approach is right. We have a clear direction. We want to reduce the number of refugees arriving. We need to tackle the sources of migration and seek a European solution. A controversial stance from this most divisive of leaders. Should Mrs Merkel stay on as Chancellor, I ask? If it was up to me, she says, no. I used to think a lot of her but not anymore. This man says, I don't agree with the rest of her policies, but I like her position on refugees. These elections have been bruising and humiliating for Angela Merkel, but the sense here is that she will survive unscathed. First of all, no one's calling for her resignation. Secondly, her approval ratings, while they've dipped, are still the envy of other European leaders. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly of all, there is no heavyweight political opponent waiting in the wings to snatch away her chancellorship. Mrs Merkel might just have got away with it. Jenny Hill, BBC News, Magdeburg. 
Now to the fallout from yesterday's deadly bombing in the Turkish capital, Ankara, which killed 37 people. Turkey's prime minister says it's detained 11 suspects directly connected with the attack, which they've linked to Kurdish rebels. Turkish fighter jets have carried out airstrikes on Kurdish targets in northern Iraq, as the president promised to bring the forces of terror to their knees. Our correspondent Mark Lowen reports. After the horror, the grief. At Ankara's morgue today, families learnt the identities of those inside, killed in yesterday's car bomb. Loved ones whose worst fears were confirmed. The blast struck near a transport hub on a busy Sunday evening. So powerful, it's as though the sky was set alight. At the local hospital, the list of the dead, 37 names so far. Jan Tech was lucky. He sustained head injuries, but little more. The scene he describes is like a vision from hell. It was like Armageddon. All I could see was red. People were screaming. The ground was covered with broken glass. It was just like an earthquake. I saw a girl's body torn in two. It's the third attack in Ankara in five months. This was October. Suicide bombings killed over a hundred, blamed on the Islamic State group. Then last month, another car bomb in the capital, leaving almost 30 dead. Kurdish militants said they carried it out. What is happening to Turkey? A NATO member and EU hopeful stuck in a cycle of attacks. This nation nervous but defiant. Even now my voice is shaking. I left university early today because my parents are afraid. I'm afraid. It's not just the bombers who are to blame, but those who allowed it to happen. I am not afraid uh, because if I'm uh, afraid, the uh, terrorism will win. Two attackers have been identified, both allegedly members of the PKK Kurdish guerrillas. At the scene, a single tribute resisted the downpour. Turkey is getting worryingly used to such attacks. There's anger here at the government for a perceived lack of security and for a foreign policy that has led Turkey, once the stable corner of this region, into such a vulnerable position. And there's fear over when the next strike will come and over the chaos into which this country is now sliding. <laughs> Yet again, Turks are burying their own. The worry when, not if, these scenes will be repeated. Mark Lowe in BBC News, Ankara. And we'll be live to Mark in Ankara shortly. Let's take a look at some of the day's other news stories. The accidental release of a gas mixture which was supposed to put out fires has killed eight contractors at a bank in Bangkok. Siam Commercial Bank, one of Thailand's biggest, said maintenance work was taking place on a fire system at its headquarters when it was apparently set off by mistake. A fighter jet from the United Arab Emirates has crashed in Yemen after suffering a technical fault, killing both pilots. The UAE is part of the Saudi-led coalition fighting on the government's side against Houthi rebels in Yemen's civil war. Local officials say the plane was carrying out bombing raids in northwestern Aden before it came down. The BBC programme Top Gear is well known for getting into hot water, but now it's had to say sorry even before the series has gone on air. Its new star Chris Evans has apologised unreservedly after scenes of the show were filmed too close to a British war memorial. Veterans have called the stunts gravely disrespectful and in bad taste. Our entertainment correspondent Lizo Mazimba reports. It's a show already under the media microscope. Then this weekend, footage and stills taken by onlookers appear to show a car performing stunts close enough to the Cenotaph War Memorial to cause widespread offence. Top Gear presenter Chris Evans said he was mortified. The images show are uh, terrible. They look so disrespectful. Um, there are mitigating circumstances, but absolutely no, unreservedly apologise. You know, I saw the images this morning for the first time and I felt the same way as everybody else. The filming had already been attracting comments on social media. Chancellor George Osborne saying, trying to write my budget, despite noisy episode of Top Gear being filmed outside on Horse Guards Parade. And when pictures of exactly where the filming had been taking place emerged, figures like Sir Roger Moore said, I was brought up to respect those who laid down their lives for this country. Shame on Top Gear and the BBC. Chris Evans has also now indicated that he thinks the stunt footage shouldn't be used in the show. One former senior army officer says the filming should never have been allowed. Well, I'm very 
glad that um, that the BBC have uh, both apologised for what happened and effectively indicated they won't be screening it. I think it was a, a, an error of judgment. Although, having said that, I think the uh, equally culpable, perhaps even more culpable, is the Westminster City Council, which gave permission for the filming. If they hadn't done so, then none of this would have happened. I think they should have been well aware of the sensitivities of that particular site. Westminster Council has said the BBC's to blame, not them, saying, at no time had BBC producers made Westminster City Council aware that the car was going to be doing anything but drive down Whitehall. There was no discussion between BBC producers and Westminster City Council about wheel spins and a donut, and permission would not have been given to do so. After the departure of Jeremy Clarkson, some had thought many of Top Gear's image problems might be in the past. Yet again, the programme's becoming just as well known for provoking controversy. Lisa Mazimba, BBC News. Let's go back to our main story, the announcement by Russia that it's going to withdraw uh, the main part of its military forces from Syria. With me, our Middle East editor, Jeremy Bowen. Uh, everybody, Jeremy's been saying what a surprise this has come as. I think it was a great surprise. Nobody anticipated that this was going to happen, except, I suppose, the people around President Putin, the president himself, and no doubt the people around President Assad and that president, too. I think it's another clever piece of diplomacy from Putin and from the, the smart foreign policy team that he has around him. Uh, I think once again he's setting the pace in the Middle East as he's been doing for the last six months when it comes to Syria. And I think that because they've made a point of saying they retain their air base, they retain their naval base, you know, they can, it's a short flight, they can beef it up again if they need to. This uh, statement that the majority of their objectives have been achieved on the ground. There's going to be a lot of scepticism about that because as far as everybody else can see, Islamic State group is still there. Well, I think it makes it clear that their objectives were not really the group calling itself Islamic State. Their, the, the main objective was to give their, the Kremlin's guy, President Assad, uh, a, a big impetus to shore him up. And I think they've succeeded in doing that because in the last six months or so, the strategic picture there has changed. There's a different balance on the ground. And there's always now still in the background, because the principle of Russia intervening has certainly been uh, established, that they could do it again. And maybe they will continue doing military sorties because, of course, you know, because they still, have pe they still will have people there. But, you know, there's a ceasefire going on at the moment. And I think now it means that the Russians can uh, talk to those involved in Geneva and say at the peace talks there and say, we are a responsible member of the international community. We're working for peace. The timing, obviously, is very interesting, as you say. Uh, what will this do to what is going on in Geneva? How much of an impact? Uh, I think that I'm not sure what kind of an impact it will have on the negotiations, but what it will do is, of course, you know, a big, big sticking point. I mean, there are many sticking points, but a major one that has been talked about by both sides is the future of President Assad. Well, Putin has shown that, I mean, he may not be wedded forever to President Assad, but for the time being, he's his man. And he's shown that, that, that he's in a much better position now, a stronger position than he was halfway through last year. Uh, and I think that means that the Syrian side can go in, the Syrian government side can go in uh, with a little bit more of a song in its heart than otherwise it might have. How much will the Syrian regime likely have been consulted about what was going to be announced today? I think they, I think they consult very closely. I mean, I mean that would be my, my feeling about the whole thing because, you know, who has been keeping President Assad, what forces have been keeping President Assad going since the war started five years ago? The fact that the Syrian army, despite being weakened, is still cohesive, a cohesive fighting force, certainly the elite units, and the help that he got from Iran, from Lebanese Hezbollah, Shiite militia, and also the Russians. Initially, diplomatically, diplomatic cover at the UN in New York. Subsequently, direct military intervention. So, you know, it's not a bad list of allies to have if you're fighting a war to try and preserve your position and the regime that your family established 50 years ago. Jeremy, thank you very much. Jeremy Bowen. Now, uh, is there life on Mars a question that's fascinated researchers and science fiction writers alike? Well, now Europe and Russia have launched their first joint mission to the Red Planet in search of an answer. A rocket blasted off from Kazakhstan, bound for a seven-month journey through space. Our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh, reports. On its way to search for life on another world. 
the spacecraft begins its 300 million mile journey. When it arrives at Mars in October, it will analyze traces of a gas called methane that could have been created by living organisms. Where we thought previously it was a barren and sterile planet and there was nothing to be found there, everything has become more and more likely to lean towards the fact that actually there could still be life there. The first views of the Martian landscape, taken in the 1970s, seemed to show a dry, dead planet. But images taken from space over the past 20 years showed that there was water frozen under the surface. And last year, the most remarkable pictures yet. Channels recently carved by flowing water. And where there's water, there may be life. It's here at this Mars mock-up in Stevenage that the rover that will search for that life is being designed and tested. This is a prototype of the rover Europe will be sending to Mars in two years' time. It'll be the first that's able to drill deep into the Martian surface. Now that's important because if there is life on Mars, it's going to be found several metres under the ground. Life is more likely to exist under the Martian surface because it's shielded from the radiation from space that bombards the red planet. We have a, red, green and blue. a British team is developing the rover's camera. It will be using a series of filters to find the most likely place for life to exist. It's a very exciting time for Mars exploration. We're on the brink, perhaps, of discovering whether there is or was life on Mars, and these two missions are perfectly placed to do it. So by the end of the decade, we might have the answer to the question of is there or was there life on Mars? If they do find life, it's likely that it's commonplace across the galaxy. Scientists will then know that we are not alone in the universe. Palab Ghosh, BBC News. Let's go back to the aftermath of that deadly attack in the Turkish capital, Ankara, on Sunday. 37 people killed in that. Uh, our correspondent, Mark Lowen, is in Ankara. And, Mark, some very strong words coming from the Turkish president. Yeah, very defiant words from uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan saying not just those carrying out terror attacks, but those involved in encouraging terror and uh, and inciting terror uh, must also be prosecuted. Um, the the uh, implication really is journalists, opposition journalists, uh, who uh, he believes is part, a part of this terror plot, and uh, opposition MPs as well, um, from the pro-Kurdish party particularly, uh, are being implicated by President Erdogan in all of this. Um, uh, there's been a wave of attacks against uh, PKK targets in northern Iraq uh, because the government believes the PKK, the Kurdish separatist organization, uh, banned militant group, uh, is behind this uh, attack. Um, but the government has to move very fast because it has got Got to reassure a very, very shaken country, uh, a country that is struggling to comprehend how yet another suicide bombing could have taken place in the heart of the capital, the third such attack in the space of five months. And what is going on, Mark, uh, with the latest investigation into what happened on Sunday? Well, uh, the Prime Minister says that um, the investigation should be probably, or the initial investigation should be wrapped up tomorrow uh, when uh, they will give an, a definitive answer as to who they believe was behind it. But already there have been so many rumours and so much speculation that they believe it was indeed the PKK. Um, they, they have identified, they believe, two bombers, a man and a woman. Um, the woman was identified because of body parts actually at the scene and both of the bombers died um, uh, and they are both thought to have been working on working for the PKK so um, uh, the the forensic teams are still at the site they're still piecing, piecing this together but there are of course big questions as to uh, the government's ability to maintain security the fact that this happened just less than a month actually after the last car bomb uh, in in the center of Ankara and this was a city that once felt so safe and is now uh, asking very 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 difficult questions of, of itself and of the of the government too. Mark, thanks very much. Mark Lowen there in the Turkish capital. Now in a rapidly changing globalised world, our sense of who we are and where we belong is becoming more important than ever. Next month, the BBC's Identity series will try to get under the skin of these issues directly relevant to many of us here at the BBC. Nora Westbrook has spent much of her working life in Hong Kong, which, as she describes, gives her a different outlook to her brother. When I meet someone for the first time, one of the first things I always get asked, and I'm sure most mixed-race people can relate to this, is where are you from? 
My brother and I were born and we grew up in Hong Kong. Our father is English and our mother is Malaysian. I could be Arabic, you know, I could, I could be English mates think I'm, I've got no mixed blood in me, you know, or I could be South American. Um, you know, it, it, it always surprises me. There's always someone new who's going to say, oh, that, that's another country you're from. Yeah, I, I'm definitely proud of my Asian heritage, though, my, my Asian roots. But, um, but in, England's definitely my home now. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that you feel more English because I think I definitely feel more Asian or connect a bit more with that Asian side. Maybe it's because I went back and I lived in Hong Kong and I look a bit more Asian and I don't sound English. Having that background of growing up in, a, in an international school, in an international city, is that people seem familiar. There isn't, there isn't so much of a barrier. Exactly, you've just got that instant sort of opportunity just to take people as they are. Everyone's just another person with a different story to tell. Now, just to, to say one line on our top story, US officials have said that they had no advance warning of President Putin's decision to withdraw the main part of Russian forces from Syria. That announcement that uh, the majority of Russian forces would be leaving Syria came uh, just in the last couple of hours uh, from the Kremlin. That is it from the programme. The weather is coming next, but for now, for now, from me, Karin Ginoni, and the rest of the team here, goodbye.